Hello everybody, my name is Wolfgang Bro, and I will talk today about the recycling of nucleosides, reagents and solvents during the synthesis of oligonucleotides. Due to the emerging necessity for larger quantities of modified oligonucleotides, the recycling of reagents, solvents and nucleotides may become a necessity. It would render the oligonucleotide lab green and may even save cost. Here I will give you some suggestions. Before we talk about the recycling reactions of reagents and nucleosides during oligonucleotide synthesis, an overall overview of the process itself. It starts as shown on this slide with a 5' dimethoxytriatelated and base protected nucleoside bound via its 3' position to a polymeric support indicated as gray circle. The 5' protecting group is extremely acid labile and can be removed with dilute acid to give a nucleoside bound to a polymeric support but now bearing a 3-5' hydroxy function. This 5' hydroxy function is then involved in the condensation with a phosphoramidide, shown in red, giving a dinucleotide trialkyl phosphide bound to the polymeric support, as seen on the, upper, on the lower right corner of this slide. As you may notice, some of the original support-bound starting material has not reacted. These give, this will give rise to failure sequences, and in order to avoid an accumulation of those failure sequences, it will be capped in a subsequent step. The trial called phosphide between the two nucleosides is extremely labile and will be oxidized subsequently to give a phosphotriester, which allows further progression through the synthesis cycles. The unreacted support-bound nucleoside we've mentioned before will then be acetylated and removed for further reactions with phosphoramidides. As you may now see, looking at the left part of this slide, you see that there is a dinucleotide with a 5' dimethoxy trial group, very similar to the mononucleoside we had in the first cycle. Now the next cycle can begin with the deprotection of the 5' hydroxy function, subsequent coupling, oxidation, capping, and so on, until the oligonucleotide is being synthesized. The part of the oligonucleotide synthesis where recycling technology could be implemented is the part where most valuable wastes are generated. This is the coupling reaction. The coupling reaction requires access of nucleoside phosphoramidides, first to drive the reaction to completion, but also to overcompensate side reactions with residual water present in reagents, solvents and on the polymeric support. The hydrolysis products of the phosphoramidide, the hydrogen phosphonates, seen on the bottom part of this slide, do not participate further during the coupling reaction. They will be washed off from the polymeric support after the coupling reaction is over. Surely, Solid phase oligonucleotide synthesis requires access of nucleotide building blocks, but should one bother to recycle them? Recycling may in fact be useful when highly modified unnatural nucleotide analogs are constantly required, or perhaps in case of a large scale oligonucleotide synthesis, for instance an API synthesis of SI RNAs or RNA aptamer molecules. Recycling may not be useful for occasional synthesis of a few ODs of natural oligonucleotides. 
Generally, an individual cost-benefit evaluation is required. Nucleus art recycling requires hardware modifications. One possibility is to divert the effluent of the reactor or column through a selector valve to corresponding waste bottles, one for each nucleoside. The diversion is possible when the signal from the computer that drives the synthesizer is used. That signal determines which nucleoside is pushed into the column in the first place. Therefore, it could also be used to divert the nucleoside into its appropriate bottle. But that is only one possibility. Once the nucleotide waste is diverted into nucleoside-specific bottles, a wide range of reactions may be performed accessing interesting nucleoside or nucleotide derivatives, as shown on this slide. We will talk about some of them. At first, there is the dephosphonylation of the cyanoethyl hydrogen phosphonate to the nucleoside with a free 3' prime hydroxy function. The latter could easily be converted to a phosphoramidite in high yields using known procedures. The phosphoramidite, in turn, is the starting material for the oligonucleotide synthesis, concluding the recycling process. This recycling process is a transesterification whereby a hydrogen phosphonate is transferred from the nucleoside to a suitable acceptor alcohol, such as methanol. This process is catalyzed by base. Therefore, the base used to propagate that reaction, in our case imidazole, has to be present in excess over the tetrazole present in the hydrolysate coming from the oligonucleotide synthesis. Since it is an equilibrium process, the acceptor alcohol also has to be present in vast excess. Prior to aqueous work up, the reaction has to be quenched. In this case, the hydrogen phosphonates are converted into phosphodiesters. This prevents back reaction during evaporation and work up. Aqueous work up can then proceed and the nucleoside can be obtained after precipitation without any column chromatography in pure form. This recycling process had been developed to be compatible with generally used acyl, acetal and trial protective groups. It is not tolerated by amidine groups used for some bases. Another recycling process uses methanolic potassium fluoride as general base. As you can see on that slide, the concentration of base has a profound impact on the rate. There may also be, however, a nucleophilic assistance by fluoride ions. This transesterification process has been found to be compatible with acyl protective groups for bases and also acetyl protective groups. It is incompatible with amidines and also salar groups, particularly if the salar groups are positioned in the 2' hydroxy function of ribonucleoside building materials. In the latter case, the salar groups may migrate and the product will not be useful. This slide evidences the plasticity range in which a meaningful transesterification reaction of the hydrogen phosphonate may occur. As you may see, aniline with a pKa of 4.6 is too acidic to drive the reaction. However, imidazole and methylmorpholin, or aqueous potassium fluoride, promote the transesterification reaction. The stronger the base, the faster the reaction will be. In turn, morpholin also drives the reaction very quickly. However, in absence of alcohol, a different reaction may occur. This is the beta elimination of the cyanoethyl group, giving a monosubstituted hydrogen phosphonate. The acceptor alcohol has also a profound impact on the transesterification reaction. As you see on that slide, phenol inhibits the reaction because it neutralizes the base catalyst. In turn, 
2-hydroxypropionitrile gives a more rapid reaction than methanol because it is more acidic and therefore exists in a larger percentage as alkoxide, a nucleophile particularly suited to attack phosphorus species. The transesterification process is not limited to the three prime position of nucleosides only. This study was geared to investigate applications of this process for capping or five prime modifications of polynucleotides. Herein, a nucleoside bound to a support by its three prime position was converted to its hydrogen phosphonate diester. The latter was subjected to transesterification for a determined time period. The reaction could then be terminated by washing off the reagents and oxidizing the support-bound nucleotides. The latter may be assayed by HPLC MS after ammonial cleavage from the support. This slide evidences that the cyanoethyl group is a much better leaving group in the transesterification process than methanol. As you may see, the cyanoethyl nucleoside hydrogen phosphonate is first converted into the methyl nucleoside hydrogen phosphonate before the nucleoside is being released. Here we summarize the various factors that impact the transesterification rates. Methanol, among the alcohols used, provides lower rates than the more acidic cyanoethanol. Among bases, one can say that the stronger the base, the more rapid the transesterification process. In turn, Brunstedt acids inhibit the reaction. Lewis acids, however, accelerate it. Recovery of nucleosides could also be expanded to methyl phosphonate synthesis. In this case, the hydrolysate of the methyl phosphone amides are being hydrolyzed in presence of catalytic amounts of tetra and butyl ammonium fluoride, which acts as base and nucleophilic catalyst. Here we can see the process for the recovery of nucleosides for methyl phosphonate building blocks. Please note that the tetra and butyl ammonium fluoride used in this process is truly catalytic. Upon release of the nucleoside, the reactive fluoromethylphosphine oxide is formed. That hydrolyzes again, giving rise to fluoride, concluding the catalytic cycle of this recovery process. When all the nucleosides are liberated, we have to quench the reaction with an oxidant to avoid back reaction during workup. Workup is then very simple and most nucleosides can be obtained in high yields. Another recycling process is the conversion of the phosphoramidide hydrolysates into hydrogen phosphonate building blocks. This is performed using strong base and absence of hard nucleophiles. These conditions contrast sharply the conditions of the recycling processes we discussed earlier that required alcohol and weak base. Here the recovery process for hydrogen phosphonate monoesters. The strength of the base that drives this process has a pronounced impact on the reaction rate. With DPU, the reaction is concluded in 5 minutes. Aqueous workup follows and the products usually can be obtained in high yields. As consequence of this recycling process, there may be a vast availability of hydrogen phosphonate building blocks. The latter may be easily used for shorter oligonucleotides or a backbone modified sequences. Another option for the recycling of nucleosides is the oxidative workup of the phosphoramidide hydrolysates. The latter, when being treated with an amine and iodine, form nucleoside phosphoramidates. When, however, they are treated with sulfur transfer reagents or elemental sulfur, phosphothoate diesters are formed. The latter are versatile building blocks and we will talk about them in a minute. They can be obtained in high yields and great purity. 
Particularly intriguing is the ferroalkylation of the nucleoside cyanoethyl hydrogen phosphonates. This reaction converts the hydrolysates of phosphoamidites with alkyl thiotosylates to OOS thiotriesters, very versatile starting materials. The thioalkylation of nucleoside cyanoethyl hydrogen phosphonates with alkyl thiosulfonates is usually a high yielding, rapidly progressing reaction. In turn, the S alkylation of nucleoside phosphorphoate diesters is sluggish and accompanied by many side products. The thioalkylation process begins with the O cyanylation of the nucleoside cyanoethyl hydrogen phosphonate. The resulting dialkyl cyanide phosphide is highly prone for electrophilic attack by the thioalkylating agent. The resulting phosphonium ion then rapidly undergoes an Arbusov rearrangement giving the nucleoside phosphorphoate triester. The latter may be used to obtain oligonucleotide phosphorthoates according to a triester methodology described by Efimov et al. One has to realize that all the groups except for the nucleoside that surround the phosphorus are protective group that can be removed selectively. The process begins by disanolethylation with triethylamine. The resulting nucleoside phosphorphoate diester is one coupling component. The alcohol component to obtain an internucleotidic linkage would then be obtained by detritylation of a nucleoside. Under those conditions, the other two groups on the phosphorus, the cyanoethyl group, or in this case the dichlorobenzyl group, would be stable. Both components can then be coupled resulting a phosphothioate triester. Here I present some HPLC traces of dimers synthesized according to this methodology. You may note that the phosphothioate triesters formed in those coupling reactions are not formed stereoselectively. This is why we have always mixtures of diastereomers. Here we can see a summary of the nucleoside recovery processes we have discussed so far in this presentation. They include oxidation to a phosphorothioate diester, thioalkylation to a phosphorothioate triester, oxidation to a phosphoramidate, beta elimination to a hydrogen phosphonate, or transesterification to a nucleoside. Another issue is the recycling of chlorinated solvents used in the detritylation reaction and the recovery of the trital group itself, which accounts for about half of the molecular weight of the nucleotide building blocks. When we attempt to recover the dimethoxy trital group, the most commonly used 5' protecting groups in oligonucleotide synthesis, we may encounter several problems. Dimethoxytriatylated monomers do not crystallize readily, but form amorphous solids. The triatylated reaction products of a detriatylation reaction do not crystallize either. Conversion of them to dimethoxytriatyl chloride is generally uh, accompanied by various darkly colored decomposition products. Long 5' dimethoxytriatylated oligonucleotides may not have sufficient retention to allow clean reverse phase purification. Therefore, dimethoxytriatyl as protecting group may not be ideal for the recycling. In turn, the properties imposed by the tristibutyl triatyl or triple T group are somewhat different. Triple T monomers crystallize much better than dimethoxy triatylated ones. Triple T chloride crystallizes readily. Triple T chloride may also be readily obtained upon treatment of the triatylated reaction products of the detriatylation reaction 
or uh, tristibutyl triadyl alcohol with thionyl chloride. This product will be obtained without discolored decomposition products. Long triple T oligos do have sufficient retention for facile reverse phase purification. Triple T is readily recycled. Here is the triple T recycling process. As during usual oligonucleotide synthesis, the detriolation solution is drained from the reactor and the yield of the coupling is determined. Then the solution is evaporated and the dichloromethane recovered. The resulting triadyl species are then converted to triple T chloride with thionyl chloride. This triple T chloride can readily be obtained in crystalline form as a commodity which could be used for monomer synthesis. HPLC profiles of DMT and triple T protected oligos are shown on this slide. Under A, there is a tenmer which is 5 prime dimethoxy triadylated. B shows a triple T protected tenmer of the same sequence. It is obvious that the greater hydrophobicity of the triple T group would facilitate the triadyl on purification. On the right, we see a series of oligonucleotides with triple T protection. Here the reagent and solvent recycling during oligonucleotide synthesis. On the left we see the starting materials, the oxidizer, the capping solution, the phosphoramidides, the dichloromethane which will be used to make the detriolation solution and the acetonitrile. On the right we see the product, the oligonucleotides. The oxidizer and capping solutions after being used will be drained and give the non-halogenated waste. The dichloromethane of the detriadyl solution will be recycled and separated from the triadylated products. The triadylated products will be converted with thionyl chloride to give triple T chloride if triple T would be used. The acetonitrile used in the process for the washes and during the coupling reaction is being redistilled after use and could be reused in the synthesis. The nucleosides are being isolated separately, each nucleoside in a specific port. There the recycling reactions for nucleosides may occur. In this slide here we consider the transesterification reactions that would give the nucleosides with free 3 prime hydroxy functions. They could then be converted to phosphoramidides, which can then be used as starting material for the oligonucleotide synthesis. The given procedures will render an oligonucleotide lab green. Which of the recycling methodologies may be applicable for your lab will depend on your infrastructure, your synthesis scale and the used building blocks. Certainly, a critical cost estimate will be necessary to determine which of the recycling procedures may apply. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention and good luck for recycling. Goodbye.